2023 has been a year of extremes, for better and for worse, but in anime's case at least, it feels like better has mostly won out. Fight scene enthusiasts have been eaten non-stop, non-isekai fantasies come roaring back with a vengeance, and a lot of folks who missed out on Zombieland Saga were finally tricked into liking idol anime. Still, mostly is the operative word there. This year's crop of bad anime contains some of the most atrocious shit I've ever ever had to sit through, and as for the trash, well, let's just say Shea Garbage Diners have been eaten just as well as the Shonen Bros. So today, we're gonna celebrate it all. The best of the year, and the worst, and the anime that, one way or another, came out well and truly cursed. I've split these into three clear sections, so those of you who are here just for the recommendations or the roasting can find whatever you're looking for, but I do hope you'll make time for the whole thing. And in the interest of making that time as short as possible, for you, I'm just gonna jump right into things after this word from our sponsor, Opera GX. Howdy, fellow nerds. I'm Shun Tokinoya from the hit esports anime Protocol Rain, here to tell you why Opera GX is the best browser out there for gamers and otaku. What? What? You've never heard of me? Or my anime? Uh, well, uh, me and my friends, we play this hero shooter together, you know, competitively to save our local game cafe or whatever. And just look at the graphics on this thing, man. Pushes my rig right to the limit. That's why I use Opera GX, the gamer browser for gamers, to control exactly how much RAM goes to my 700 tabs of hentai mean strategy wikis. Opera GX also helps you open less tabs than that, with instant access to social apps like Instagram, TikTok, and Discord built right into the sidebar. And their handy dandy video pop-out feature means you can keep browsing the web without ever having to stop watching my anime. Or, you know, what one you've actually heard of. With the new GX mod feature, you can even transform your entire browsing experience into an interactive love letter to your favorite anime you've actually heard of, or the concept of anime in general by customizing your browser's color palette, sound effects, background music, animated wallpaper, and more. You can try that cozy anime mod for yourself or any one of the massive and ever-growing library of community-made mods and add-ons simply by visiting the GX store. And if you don't have Opera GX yet, their quick import tool makes jump and ship even simpler, letting you bring over your history, bookmarks, and cookies in just a few clicks. It's even compatible with every Google Chrome extension. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the doobly-doo to download Opera GX and then, uh... Maybe use it to Google my anime, please? Now that was a great example of the kind of anime we won't be talking about tonight, because it's very mid, frankly, and we're here to celebrate the extremes, for better or for worse, or for other. And believe me, I'm as excited to get to those last two as you are. But first, I'm just as excited to tell you about the 11 best anime I watched in 2023. Why 11? It's one louder. Also, general lack of self-control. Sorry, I, I just couldn't narrow it down to a top 10. Honestly, any one of these could have been anime of the year any other year. So the list isn't even in any particular order, except the last entry, which is my anime of the year. I was able to make that one decision and it almost killed me. Also, this probably would have been a top 12 if I was caught up on Vinland Saga, which I'm not because I, have been kind of saving it for a rainy day, so sorry that that's not on here, but please don't get too caught up on judging my taste for that one glaring omission. I know it should be. You should be judging me for what I did put on the list. You know, now that I say that, it might have been a mistake to start this with pure, unadulterated harem trash like the hundred girlfriends who really, 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 really love you, but... No, I already wrote this sentence, so no going back now. In case that audaciously bold title didn't clue you in, 100 Girlfriends is an entire anime made out of just the parts of anime that your parents always seem to walk in on. And honestly, 
it f***ing rules. Via a strange quirk of destiny, and by destiny I mean the god of love got distracted while filling out his paperwork, Rentaro Aijo has been assigned a hundred soulmates instead of the usual one. And because the universe punishes anyone who can't make it work with their soulmate with bad luck until the day they die, which will probably be really soon on account of the bad luck, he is duty bound to find and cherish every last one of them until the end of their days. Ending the story with anything less than a harem of a hundred happy hotties will mean that Rentaro has fundamentally failed as a man. Truly, no anime hero's quest has ever been more just or righteous. <laughs> <laughs> and few have ever been this long, either. At its current rate of girlfriends per chapter, the series is presently on pace to hit a similar page count to shonen manga epics like Bleach and Naruto, which it honestly kinda needs to do the premise it's promised properly. It would be one thing to just throw a hundred random cute and marketable character designs into a couple hundred chapters of rent-a-girlfriend grade pandering and call it a day, but Hundred Girlfriends aims to give each and every one of those girlfriends both unique depth as individual characters and fun, interesting chemistry, not just with Rentaro, but also each other. Sometimes a lot of chemistry. Put girls making out right there, thank you. And it does it all without ever feeling like any one of them is being neglected by the plot or their man, because it doesn't matter how believably really, 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 really lovable all these waifus are if it's not equally believable that they would all really, 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 really love Rentaro back. Luckily, it is, because he's undeniably and unflappably the greatest boyfriend to ever exist. Or not exist, as the case may be. He is a drawing. I'm sorry to shatter the illusion for you. The whole thing is just an incredible flex of character design and writing skill, elevated by an adaptation every bit as inventive and hilariously anarchic as Bochi the Rocks. Only a coward would deny Hundred Girlfriends as the anime of the year contender that it absolutely is. Speaking of Bochi, the director who gave us her hilarious anime last year put out a new masterpiece, this one that hopefully I won't have to spend nearly as long justifying, especially since I already put out a whole video on the second channel explaining why I thought Free Run Beyond Journey's End could be the anime of the year, solely based on my experience with the manga. I'm happy to report my experience with the anime has been just as great. If you're craving a proper non-portal fantasy story that'll truly transport you to another realm that has zero basis in RPG mechanics, it's been a long time, but we are eating good this season. Though it does play with RPG story tropes, to be fair. As the title suggests, this is a journey beyond the end of your typical Dragon Quest narrative. Following the thousand-year-old elf mage of the Demon King defeating Heroes Party a hundred years after the fact, as she embarks on a new ten-year quest to retrace their journey to the Demon King's castle and reconnect with memories of that paltry one one-hundredth of her lifespan that somehow changed everything about her along the way. She's followed and assisted in this quest by two younger adventurers, haughty genius mage apprentice Fern and Stark the Cowardly Dragon Slayer, who slowly grow from innocent kids to awkward adolescents to capable and confident adults as the years and miles on the long road north go by. Freerun is an undeniably epic and immersive work of fantasy that sucks the viewer into its world of magic and 
wonder, with lively animation and intoxicating music. But as far as it can take us from our own world, it still manages to hit incredibly close to home, with well-observed portrayals of day-to-day -day life in slices and in time-lapse, and a rich exploration of the human condition, a topic it highlights through contrast by focusing on characters like Freerun and other darker things with distinctly inhuman perspectives. It's a shining example of how great fantasy can deepen our understanding of our own reality, and beyond that, just a breathtakingly beautiful work of pastoral art. And I'm placing it here so early in the list to make it clear I'm serious about that whole no particular order thing. Any one of these could have capped this list off under slightly different circumstances. Under slightly different circumstances, Heavenly Delusion probably would have topped a lot of people's lists, specifically circumstances in which Disney gave even literally a single tweet's worth of a shit about promoting it or any of their other anime, which they have a surprisingly great lineup of, actually, from indie gems like the sorta sequel to Tatami Galaxy to Shonen Jump blockbusters like Bleach and Undead Unlock. You just wouldn't know it looking at any of their marketing or social platforms or even your own homepage, even if you're someone like me who mostly watches anime on Disney+, Plus, though they do at least give a well-deserved spotlight to the classic Oka no Osama, so credit where it's due there. Disney did one of last year's best anime, Summertime Rendering, insanely dirty by not just sticking it in localization jail for the better part of a year, but dumping it out in the middle of January with literally zero fanfare. Again, not even a single tweet. And while they did at least have the sense to simulcast Heavenly Delusion, thus allowing people who are, you know, watching it while it's airing to watch it while it's airing and talk about it while it's airing, they ended up doing it just as dirty by tossing out the English title that fans of the manga were already using to de-rebrand it as Tengoku Daimakyo, which, if it's not obvious what's wrong with that title, just ask yourself, would we still be talking about Shingeki no Kyojin in 2023 if Crunchyroll had tried to sell us Shingeki no Kyojin in 2013 instead of Attack on Titan or the superior Yotena Onslaught? I know that's an extreme example. Not every anime can pull that kind of mainstream clout, but I don't say this lightly. Heavenly Delusion really might have if Disney put literally any marketing muscle behind it. It's really that awesome. <laughs> Mixing self-evidently top-tier animated action with heady transhumanist philosophical themes and a genuinely clever post-apocalyptic mystery that I'm loath to spoil, Tengoku Delusion is at once a somber thinking man's anime and a f***ing awesome late-night cavalcade of cartoon blood and tits and shit. One of them condensed, self-contained, certified cool anime like Akira, Cowboy Bebop, Ghost in the Shell, or Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust that people who remember what a VHS is or constantly complaining don't get made anymore. Turns out they do get made anymore. Disney's just been holding out on us. Though not quite as hard as they held out with Summertime Rendering, which is one of the best mystery anime of any kind I've ever seen in my life. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. You can see for yourself what makes it so darn good with the free month of Disney Plus you're gonna get to check out Heavenly Daimakyo. Speaking of shows you should go into blind though, Oshino Ko became the year's first new frontrunner for anime of 
it by coming out swinging with a feature length roller coaster ride of a premiere culminating in the mother of all rug pulls, which I will have to spoil at least vaguely to talk about the show like at all, so skip to the next section if you haven't seen it and missed all my very good videos about it. Aka Akasaka constructed the story of Kaguya-sama Love is War with deceptive brilliance, hiding complex continuity and dynamic reactive character arcs within the typically static format of a gimmicky episodic gag manga. He combined Maison Ikoku caliber character comedy and romantic tension with Death Note caliber mind games and romantic tension to create a shonen-ish rom-com unlike any other, which was then perfected by the passionate team of animators who condensed and adapted it for the small screen. With Oshino Ko, he's done it once again, giving us a brilliant, subtly supernatural slice of pop idol life dramedy wrapped around a Death Note adjacent edgy smart boy Machiavellian revenge thriller, wrapped around a good old fashioned murder mystery, wrapped around a fascinating post mortem character study of the star of the different subtly supernatural slice of pop idol life dramedy that we thought we were gonna watch prior to the aforementioned rug pull. Look, pal, I warned you this segment wouldn't make any sense if you hadn't seen the anime. It's not my fault that last sentence was like that. Tell Akasaka-sensei to be less of a genius next time. <laughs> The brilliance of his character writing is on especially strong display here, with each one of the half dozen and counting principal cast members feeling convincingly like the protagonists of their own stories, all of which intersect in the seedy underbelly of Japan's brutal and exploitative entertainment industry as Aqua and Ruby navigate their way through it. A setting that, like all topics Akasaka touches, is impeccably researched and authentically portrayed, and, you know, I, I already said all this in a big long video essay this summer, the length of which alone is a testament to how much I love this anime. And it's a testament to how absolutely insane this year was that it's not in the top spot. But to me, at least, it's even more of a testament that I couldn't give that spot to my top Scott. Pilgrim, that is. Takes off, to be specific. Which I have to be, since the new Netflix original anime isn't just the gorgeously animated retelling of Scott Pilgrim many fans were expecting, but rather a full-on Evangelion-style rebuild of Scott Pilgrim. A chance for the original creator to re-examine and reinterpret his characters and core themes to bring the story to a more mature, emotionally fulfilling conclusion than he was capable of writing way back then. One which aims to complement, celebrate, and enhance the original comic and film and pixel art beat-em-up rather than contradict or replace any of them. But that's not all it is. It's also Scott Pilgrim 2, The New Batch, Twin Pilgrims, a limited event series on Showtime. And a little bit Pilgrims 12. If I wanted to be cute and also accurate, I could also call the series Lucas Lee's Pro Skater, Sex bob -omb Mongolian Chop Squad, Gideon Graves Gets It Together, and a ton of other incredible things I never knew I needed as either a Scott Pilgrim or anime fan which the mad geniuses at Science Saru have Voltron together in perfectly animated time with an incredible and eclectic indie punk chiptune soundtrack to form what I can only describe as the fully cooly follow-up we never got. As for the ones we did get, Stay tuned for the worst and most cursed. Of course, it would have been awesome to see the story I love so much from the comics properly animated, but 
I can always reread those comics for that story. They are very good comics, and now, when I do, my enjoyment of them is only amplified by the new perspectives this version provides on their world and characters. And on top of enhancing my enjoyment of the very good and fun comics and movie and pixel art beat-em-up, now I get to watch Roxy Richter Inception fight Ramona through a paprika scape of action movie references before making out with Kim Pine. I'm so happy to be alive right now. If these entries were in any particular order, Scott Pilgrim Takes Off would probably be second or third from the top, but even then, it'd only be a hair's breadth ahead of the competition. I can't even say for sure it's the best gamer anime this year, because Shangri-La Frontier is here to expose every VR MMO anime before it, VR or otherwise, for the hack noob frauds they all are. Well, okay, that's not entirely fair or fair at all, really. Overlord's still great, so's Bofuri, Log Horizon. Ixion Saga DT. Hell, just this season, Netflix dropped Good Night World, and that absolutely rules with its EVE Online-inspired player politics and psychological horror elements. But that's the thing. All of those anime need something beyond the game itself to hold our interest in their stories. Most gamers have long since come to accept that non-interactive media will just never be able to capture the feeling of fighting a truly great boss in a god-tier game like Sekiro with your own two thumbs. The tension and drama inherent to those kinds of challenges is something that you need to play to really feel. Or so we thought. Shangri-La Frontier proves we all just gave up on that too soon. There's no death game to distract us here, no effort to artificially inflate the drama by adding flimsy real-world stakes, just the alluring, extremely specific science fiction fantasy of getting good at a theoretical perfect future game the full-dive-enabled, AI-driven Elden Ring of Warcraft killers, with nothing but your pride as a gamer on the line. <laughs> On paper, series hero Sunraku isn't really all that conceptually different from your typical bog-standard Kirito, a dude with such good reflexes and gaming skills, he effectively becomes the protagonist of what's supposed to be a multiplayer game. But unlike Kirito, he actually has a personality, and also unlike Kirito, he can actually lose at that game without the story instantly ending. And he does a lot, sometimes when it matters even, and one time over a hundred times to the same basic bitch mini-boss with one cheap attack that just happens to hard counter his whole build, who hasn't been there. So we get a varied textured, authentic portrayal of the kind of emergent storytelling that well-designed game systems can enable, where success and failure feel like equal possibilities at any moment, dependent on our hero's skill, not his plot armor and where SAO ruined the illusion of its massively multiplayer setting by treating everyone outside Kirito's friend list and most people on it, honestly, like NPCs, SLF takes pains to fill its world with vibrant, memorable, self-motivated characters, each playing the game their own way. So no matter what kind of gamer you are, be it a lore hound, a Pokemon collector, or a sexy player-killing dommy mommy, you'll find your playstyle represented by someone in SLF's sprawling, hyper-advanced virtual world. Out of all the gamer anime I've seen, or gamer manga I've read for that matter, since I'm already nine volumes deep on Bookwalker, nothing else gets it quite like Shangri-La Frontier. <laughs> It's not often I feel compelled to read ahead in the manga, even after an anime I really like is over, let alone in the middle of it, so of course that says a lot for SLF, but Jujutsu Kaisen had that effect on me by like episode 5 of season 1, and I haven't hopped off that hype train since. I haven't pulled Yazzie aboard, and even though she's not usually into shonen, she's fallen in so deep a lesser man might feel a little threatened by it. 
Not me, though, I'm right there with her. Satoru Gojo and Suguru Geto are two of the most fascinatingly flawed, believably human superhuman rivals in any shonen manga not written by Togashi. And they're not even the heroes of the main plot, just the S-tier 10 out of 10 prologue that's covered by the movie in the first five episodes of this season. Every single character in this series is simply written that good. The characterization for heroes and villains major and minor alike is as nuanced, understated, and grounded in observed humanity as the best slice-of-life dramas out there. Yet at the same time, every last action scene in this anime whips harder than a pissed-off Kurama. <laughs> And for as much effort as Gege Akutami clearly put into developing these characters and making them empathetic and likable, he's also clearly not afraid to put his babies through the ringer when the story calls for real life or death consequences. Or just when he feels like it, because he's kind of a jerk like that. But those unpredictable jerk-like tendencies are exactly what makes the Shibuya arc, which was current in the manga when I first binged it in three days flat, the the hardest hitting, most memorable series of shonen street brawls you'll see anywhere outside York New City. So, needless to say, it's been quite exciting for me to finally see all of that animated, doubly so considering how exciting all that animation is. MAPPA's outsourcing heavy production process may be held to work under, but it does mean that each episode director and animator gets to put their own distinct cinematic, often horny stamp on the manga's many iconic moments, giving the animation a Gurren Lagann-esque experimental energy that makes each new fight and episode a delightful surprise even when you've read ahead. Though the aforementioned emotional depth of the dialogue also helps quite a bit with that. This is one of those stories that only gets better on repeat viewings when you know what all the characters are really thinking and plotting and can dive deeper into their psychology which also makes the fights cooler and it's just it's just really good if you're looking for that kind of character depth with less risk of those characters uh, disappearing on you in the middle of you you know feeling stuff about them actually this year gave us quite a few really great laid-back dramas and love stories to sink our teeth into but out of all the non-JJK shows that Yazzie and I have become obsessed with this year, Insomniacs After School just hits different, man. A tale of two teens whose vastly different life circumstances have nonetheless led them to pretty much the same shitty place. Tangled in sweat-soaked sheets at 6 a.m., staring at the ceiling, trying and failing not to count the minutes till the sun comes up again. Scared of becoming burdens on those around them, both the bubbly, outgoing Isaki and nerdy curmudgeon Ganta keep this condition a secret from their classmates until the inevitable day they run into each other in their school's most primo nap spot, the old observatory, and discover that they're not as alone as they thought. Suddenly, the interminable void between dawn and daybreak is the time they most look forward to, and the observatory becomes their secret oasis from the light of day. Eventually, the school finds out, of course, but that just means they need to start the old astronomy club back up, which fuels a slow-growing passion for nature photography in Ganta and gives them both a good excuse to wander around after curfew, giving us, in turn, a great excuse to soak in some soothing Inaka After Hours vibes as we get to know them, their friends and family, and the cozy small town they all call home. This is one of those anime where it just feels like you could jump into the screen and start living in its world at any moment, and like the characters could do the same with equal ease. Which is pretty much my favorite kind of anime, and amazingly, it's not the only one like that this year. With similarly obsessive attention to detail, Overtake brings the medium-stakes world of Formula 4 racing, F1's lesser-known amateur little cousin, 
to life. Which is honestly a much better setting for a story than F1 biopics like Rush notwithstanding, for the same reason that high school sports are generally a better basis for manga and anime than the pro leagues. It's, you know, a little hard to sell a guy as a compelling underdog when he's only got slightly less millions of dollars behind him than the other, more successful guy. But a passionate young racing prodigy held back by clunky old machinery and the need to literally ration the rubber on his tires because they're like 10 grand a set? Now that's drama. That's a story. And that's exactly what burned-out photojournalist Koya Madoka thinks he's found after a chance encounter with the scrappy father-son mechanic team at Komaki Motors and their struggling underdog racer Haruka Asahina. So he decides to sponsor them, and then later, when he realizes how much the tires cost, find sponsors for them, in hopes that seeing Haruka win will reignite his own long-burned-out passion for photography. It's what I thought I'd found in this series, too, at least at first, a compelling, thoroughly researched S-tier original sports anime in the vein of Haikyuu, in that the rivals are just as empathetic and likable as the hero, meaning that each victory and defeat feels equally hype and bittersweet, and also in that those rivals are literally just Oikawa and Iwaizumi in Groucho Marx glasses. <laughs> It certainly delivers on the hype part of the equation. Aoki, who might low-key be my favorite anime director, uses dynamic camera work and crunchy, authentic sound design to put you right in the heart of the racing action and it just never stops being exciting. But as the characters, racers, and supporters alike reveal more about their lives away from the track, what drives them and what holds them back, if you know your sports anime, you'll soon come to realize this isn't an S-tier series like Haikyuu after all. It's triple S-tier, like ping pong. A story where the sport serves mostly as a catalyst for a rich exploration of obsession, ego, imposter syndrome, survivor's guilt, and other essential aspects of the human condition. A story about what it really means and really takes to bet your entire life on a talent that could fail you at any moment, be it a sport or a creative hobby. If you crave maturity and depth in your anime, you don't want to miss out on Overtake. And you really don't want to miss out on Pluto. Naoki Urasawa is almost undebatably the greatest living mangaka. If there's any significant flaw in his work, it's only that he's too good at drawing to realistically adapt. Like Berserk's Kentaro Miura, his art is just so intricate and detailed that animating it is just impractical. Since 1994, Urasawa's had five different manga serialized in bi-weekly or weekly seinen magazines, four of which are widely held among the greatest manga of all time. And the fifth one, Asadora, probably will be too once it's finished. Yet, for as widely acclaimed as these manga are, it took over a decade for the first of them, Monster, to get its adaptation. And in the 19 long years since, that 74 episode behemoth of an anime has been the only one, for admittedly good reason. In the overworked, understaffed anime industry of today, the only way to really match that level of consistent quality would be to make your anime a movie. But Urasawa's stories are all very long and complex, so that format just doesn't really work for them. If only there were some way to release, say, eight films all at once, perhaps via the internet? Enter Netflix with a giant cartoon sack of money. Pluto 
Ichigo is the third of Urasawa's masterworks, serialized in 2008 between 20th Century Boys and its 21st Century epilogue. And out of all his stories, it might be the most distinctive, because it's not entirely his. Instead, it's a ground-up reworking of a classic Astro Boy adventure, the greatest robot on Earth that reimagines Osamu Tezuka's iconic world and hero in a more mature and grounded form suited to Urasawa's style, while reframing the central mystery of an OP robot serial killer from the perspective of robot detective Gesicht, a supporting character in the original manga. Also, of course, he made a lot of other smaller changes that make the mystery feel tighter overall, lend greater depth to basically every character, major and minor alike, expand the world building in a fascinating Asimov-esque direction, and low-key turn the whole thing into an incredibly poignant commentary on the dire human consequences of Middle East forever wars. You see terrorists everywhere, but there aren't any here. You and your peacekeeping forces dropped a bomb on my sleeping baby! So, yeah, this is a pretty heavy watch, but also a deeply necessary one for anyone who can stomach it, especially now. Thankfully, it's also a deeply satisfying watch, the kind of anime you really want to savor one episode at a time as you spend the nights between just sort of staring up at the ceiling. There is a strong case to be made here that Pluto is the objectively best anime this year, but as for my personal favorite... <laughs> ZOM 100 Bucket List of the Dead is everything I look for in an anime, really. It's got action, suspense, comedy, big floppy titties, zombies, zombie boars, zombie sharks, zombie sharks, tummy, tummy, tummy. Not to mention gut-punching emotional moments that forcibly rip my tear ducts open every time I watch them, and truly profound philosophical observations that have changed the way I look at pretty much everything. Also, top tier fart jokes, which are obviously the most important thing, because for anyone who can make farts funny again, making zombies good again would be a trivial matter. And indeed, ZOM 100 does make zombies good again. Very, very good. Did I mention the shark? And hey, if you don't like animals, they also got all the human zombie types, such as shamblers, walkers, sprinters, and thrillers. Clearly, ZOM 100 likes to have fun with the whole zombie thing, so if you were hoping for yet another boring, gritty, realistic, survivalist prepper power fantasy like every other f***ing post-Snyder zombie thing, look elsewhere or just, you know, throw a rock and hit one. Or maybe don't, actually. You could probably learn a thing or two from the series' resident ex-prepper, Best Girl Shizuka, who in turn learns from wage slave turned amateur superhero Best Boy Akira and his best bud, Best Boy Kensho, that there's no real point in survivalism if you never make time to actually live. <laughs> Uh, not that these zombies pose a particularly dire threat to any of the main characters. Between Akira's shark suit and the full set of samurai armor worn by buxom German weeaboo best girl Beatrix, even sizable hordes of the things are a very solvable problem. And for the most part, the undead just end up serving as Team Rocket-style wrap-it-up buttons on the story of whatever items being crossed off the bucket list this week. Stories which can get extremely heavy and emotional, Truck Stop of the Dead is probably one of the best explorations of abuse I've seen in, like, any medium. But just as often, their light-hearted educational asides about random topics ranging from fossils to class struggle to Japanese hot springs. There's probably as much Dr. Stone DNA in this show as there is Dawn of the Dead as a sort of walk-in tour of neat factoids about Japan, and honestly, I'm f***ing here for it. I love learning about Japan. Ah, uh, life is study. What? <laughs> I'm not... You're drawing boobs! Actually, 
jokes aside, I I've been doing some serious story planning in here. Like real scene by scene plot outlining with a, I think a fairly realistic monthly word count target. Not just idle world building. And ZOM 100 directly inspired me to take that leap after letting my dream of writing a novel languish for the last seven years of YouTubing. This anime is powerful like that, a truly life-changing, life-affirming work of art that uses its undead as an ever-present reminder of just how short and precious all our lives really are. I cannot recommend enough that you give this show a shot. I wish I could just keep on recommending good anime for the rest of the video. There's definitely enough this year to fill it, but I know a lot of you are only here to see me suffer, and if I want YouTube to keep recommending my stuff, I gotta give the people what they want, so you've heard about the best anime I watched this year. Now it's time for the absolute worst. Coming in fifth, Legend of Heroes colon Trails of Cold Steel hyphen Northern War isn't quite the worst anime this year, obviously, because it's in fifth, but for me, personally, it was the biggest disappointment by far. If you haven't played or seen my videos on the Trails series of JRPGs, it's a massive fantasy epic spanning multiple years and a sprawling fantasy continent, with each sub-series taking us to a different country with a very different perspective on Lemuria's whole geopolitical outlook. The depth and complexity of the series' world building is all but unrivaled within its genre. Of course, that can also make the games a little intimidating to get into, but a full TV anime could have been a great jumping on point for new fans, and a perfect excuse for me to evangelize one of my faves some more. What's more, that subtitle, Northern War, promised something very exciting. A brand new side story exploring a corner of Zamuria the games have never reached. North Ambria, the home country of several key characters throughout the series, and the legendarily fierce Northern Jaeger Mercenary Corps, who've come up quite a bit in past games. Meaning, even if the anime failed to grab many new fans, the existing ones would at least have some meaty new lore to chew on. So what could possibly go wrong? Right. The anime industry. Of course, visuals aren't the be-all and end-all, especially not for fans of a game series that started out looking like this in 2004, but unfortunately, the story's also kind of, like, 70% complete garbage, 90% if you don't count the new lore. There are some interesting ideas and plot points sprinkled in, especially toward the end, like a big coup d'etat that complicates the titular war, and the characters do have their moments, even if their backstories are kind of one note and their designs are, uh, this guy has literally glowing blue hair streaks. But then in, many other moments, those characters are suddenly just too f***ing stupid to order ice cream right, so they end up wandering around town aimlessly trying to balance a teetering 15-scoop tower until they randomly wander into a terrorist plot between a clown and his malevolent army of mascots to blow up a fancy rich people party because they uh, somehow nebulously trade the people by, um, it's not entirely clear, actually. Then they wrestle. Yeah, 
So, yeah, it's just fundamentally not a very good TV show. And I know that's not gonna stop a lot of Trail fans out there from watching it for the lore. Sure didn't stop me. I had to, it's canon. But be forewarned, you will suffer for the few measly scraps this show throws your way. That said, if you're in the market for some exposition dumping, boy, do I ever have the anime for you. Summoned to Another World for a Second Time is a rare innovator in the isekai space, a bold experiment in narrative structure that asks what would happen if all the stuff in an isekai story already happened, so instead of watching it happen, we get to listen to a bunch of people talk about it years after the fact for literally hours, all while following a much less interesting story about one of Protag Kun's old pals doing a conspiracy to start the demon-human war back up because he put on some magic jewelry that turned him crazy and evil. Not that that conspiracy actually goes anywhere, because naturally Protag Kun's already friends with all the leaders of every country in the whole world, except the ones who are hot women. They're all in love with him, of course. So all he's got to do is, like, go around to all their houses and be like, hey, maybe let's not do war? And then they're all like, oh yeah, okay, no war. And then, hey, no war. Bro, Someone call the UN. We gotta tell them about this. Also on the way, he runs into other less geopolitically influential ladies from his past and also new ones who are also in love with him, also of course. He's even got a permanent camping spot reserved atop Mount Sundere. And, in a fun twist, we get to watch Protag Kun easily kick everyone's asses with all the overpowered abilities he got from having beat the game already, which is, you know, just such a refreshing change of pace from watching your typical generic Protag Kun easily kick everyone's asses with all the overpowered abilities he got from God turning cheats on. Now, all this might lead you to wonder how such an innovative isekai could end up on a list like this, but frankly, this one might be too groundbreaking for its own good. I fear the world just isn't ready for this level of subversive sophistication in its anime. Why the f you lying? Why? Why you always lying? Good question. The answer? To set up this segue. Liar Liar is a 1997 Hollywood comedy starring Jim Carrey as Fletcher Reed, a filthy lion lawyer who, wait, sorry, my mistake. Uh, Liar Rail is a 2023 Japanese anime about a futuristic island full of highly competitive high schools for gifted students, classrooms of the elite, if you will, which cultivate the next generation of world leaders by making them compete in extremely convoluted augmented reality games for meaningless star-shaped virtual status symbols instead of, you know, actually learning literally anything. Our hero, Hiroto, is a one-star nobody who ascends to the rank of seven star, the top student on the entire island, on his very first day after asking the previous seven star for directions and then accidentally beating her in a very convoluted staring contest through a series of increasingly stupid misunderstandings. But the thing about that is, he's not actually the seven star at all. He only won one star from the previous champ, which just happened to be a special star with the power to make one lie come true, which he has to use to pretend to be the seven star so the company that owns the island can save face because it turns out the ex-champ was the president's granddaughter, except actually she's just a stand-in for the real granddaughter who's been kidnapped, but then actually, actually, uh, you know what? Uh, you can just go check out the spring ones to watch if you want to hear me lay into this show's never-ending string of stupid plot twists. Hi, future audio-only Jeff here. Obviously, uh, you will not find me tearing into stuff in a once-to-watch video. Uh, that's the summer hottest trash that you can find that. Um, I'm sorry, we have been working on this for two straight weeks, and I'm very tired. Back to your regularly scheduled program. Liar Rail represents an important milestone in the evolution of the emerging Baka and test-like genre, where new writers have started copying the copycats like Kake Garui, and thus drifted so far from the original concept that they just have no f***ing idea what the point even is. The games the kids play here aren't even designed in any way to prepare them for the harsh dog-eat-dog -dog real world anymore, not even in stupid ways like Classroom of the Elite. They're just half-baked ideas for AR smartphone games the writer came up with and wanted to do something with in a story, with 
each arc basically forcing us to learn the rules of a new game in order to understand anything that's going on, only for the hero and possibly villain to reveal how they cheated at the end and rendered all those rules completely irrelevant to the actual conclusion of the story. Then we never see that game again, and it's time for a new exposition dump about the next set of rules that also won't matter in a week or two. Yeah, I honestly don't think this anime could be less satisfying to watch if it tried, though at least it is sometimes stupid enough to get a sarcastic laugh or two out of me, which is more than the rest of these things made me feel. In second place, we find my second biggest disappointment of the year, Fooly Cooly Grunge, which came as a serious surprise to me because I genuinely believed that my expectations for the Fooly Cooly sequels were as low as they could physically go. We all saw that trailer. I mean, nobody was expecting great things from the CG animation in this thing. But even then, man, I did not think the parts they weren't showing in the trailer would be this hilariously inept. To be clear, it's not all bad. Some of it's pretty good, even. There are a few moments where a talented animator swings for the fences and totally hits with a gorgeous sakuga shot or two or some experimental blend of trippy visuals and music that actually hits in a similar way to the original OVA. But even when that happens, chances are good the music's been recycled from that OVA, and any good animation you see will end up being recycled in this one, like two to three times over, thanks to the series' gimmicky triple protagonist story structure. And, to be clearer, most of it is bad. Very, very bad. We're talking JRPG cutscene level animation where characters just stand or sit around flapping their lips for what feels like days on end. They also do that thing where they put 2D characters next to the 3D ones because there's literally only 30 total models in this entire 90 minute show, and the clash of styles that results is somehow even more jarring than when X-Arm did that. That's just embarrassing. The show is also just criminally unfunny. Like, for some reason they decided that now the headlump things that turn into robots and other stuff can't just be knocked off not Nauta's head anymore. Now, Haruka's gotta literally jerk it off first. <laughs> Because, you know, if, if there's one thing people always complain about Fooly Cooly, it's that it's too subtle. But as atrocious as all this stuff is, as insulting as it is to the original's legacy as a landmark work of animation, that gimmicky story structure is by far the worst part. Again, I do see the vision. Three different types of kid coming of age at the same time, viewing the same world-changing event from their own unique angle. The son of a sushi artisan trying to decide for himself if that's really the life for him, the daughter of a sick old swordsmith whose mother passed away years ago, and an alien immigrant struggling with discrimination, his brother's need to do crimes to make ends meet, and the fact that his entire The Thing at Home species is genetically destined for alcoholism, which this segment's running way too long as it is, so we're not gonna unpack any of that. On paper, not a bad idea, except like everything about the rock aliens. In practice, it gives each of those three kids like 20 total minutes to develop their characters in between the story development, plus the five or so shared minutes of reused cont- I mean, the cool bits where their stories sync up. So each of the heroes ends up being paper thin, and because she's the only recurring supporting character who shows up in all three episodes, Haruko, the franchise's iconic inscrutable force of chaos and source of comedy relief, ends up getting more screen time and character development than any of the supposed protagonists. That is so f backwards, and not in the clever, subversive way that you'd hope for from a fully cooly follow-up that actually gets it. Because Haruko simply does not work as the main character. It's like trying to make a Pirates of the Caribbean movie with just Jack Sparrow or a Friends spin-off with only Joey. There is no point to comedy relief if a story has no heavier emotional arcs from which to be relieved. The other Fooly Cooly follow-ups may have been unimpressive and unnecessary, but grunge is just unbearable. Still, for as awful as it and every other anime we've talked about so far are, at least none of them tried to sell me f 
Can NFTs. 続いてトークンとはブロックチェーン技術で発行された暗号資産の総称ですそれが NFT キズナのアリール is the worst most shameless piece of VTuber cross promotional media crap ever created and I'm including 30 follower VTweeter shit posts in that statement this show fails on literally Every level. It looks like shit. The acting's mostly shit. The plot is non existent. The storyboarding's confusing and repetitive. It reuses one of the idol songs it's trying to sell so often, you'll be sick of it two episodes in. It's got five main characters with maybe three personality traits between them, and none of them are Kizuna Ai. You know, the famous VTuber the anime's named after? She's barely even f in it. The premise. The premise of the show is that I was this legendary VTuber who disappeared from the spotlight at the height of her fame after winning five straight NFTs, inspiring a new generation of virtual idols to attend Aiden Academy, basically Metaverse Hogwarts, in hopes of winning the prestigiously non fungible Lappin Door Award, just like their idol. Though our main heroine, Miracle Chan, also hopes to discover what really happened to I and prove she never abandoned. And her fans. The mostly girls go about pursuing these goals mostly by standing or sitting around talking forever, interrupted on occasion by shitty, unpolished motion capture dances to the same handful of songs over and over and over. Also, they briefly play an online VR game at one point, which technically means, on top of being the worst Moe slash idol anime of the year and possibly all time, this is also the worst VR MMO anime. <laughs> There are few anime I'd call truly vile, but Kizuna no Allele is certainly one of them. It's ugly, stupid, excruciatingly boring, and worst of all, cynical beyond measure. There is not a single morsel of joy to be found in this thing, not even the ironic kind. If you're looking for that, well, that's why cursed anime get their own category now. Though, I'm sorry, I did trick you a little. The first entry in that category is just unironically good. Mushoku Tensei 2 could have easily been on my best of year list. It would have been, in fact, if I hadn't thought of this ingenious scheme to sneak a top 12th entry onto the cursed list. But that doesn't mean it doesn't belong here. From a mainstream perspective, this anime is as cursed as it gets. You cannot post a single positive thing about jobless reincarnation in public without someone popping in to point out the protagonist is a gross 30 something. An actual literal pedophile reborn in a kid's body. And, you know, fair, I can see why someone might get a little hung up on that, but I promise you, this anime is really good. Not in spite of that uncomfortable stuff, but directly because of it. Unlike so many boilerplate isekai protagonists, Rudeus Grey Rat is a fascinatingly flawed, deeply human character, driven not by some noble need to save the world or even a selfish desire to indulge and escape, but a powerful yearning to simply become a version of himself he doesn't have to hate. Well, in the long term, at least. In the short term, over the course of season two, his goal is to cure his erectile dysfunction. No, wait, don't leave. No, seriously, don't. The quest for that cure is actually tied up in a fascinating exploration of his abandonment issues and other problems. And the whole time he's on it, he's surrounded by equally flawed, equally deep, equally human characters, all struggling with their own insecurities and vices, and all, like Rudy, seeking love and acceptance in spite of themselves because. That's what humans do. Mushoku Tensei is honest and raw and absolutely bursting with life in a way that only the very best literature, fantasy or otherwise, can even hold a candle to. If you're picking up what Freerun's putting down and want more like it, outside of Spice and Wolf and Ascendance of a Bookworm, you will not find 
anything closer than this. Mushoku Tensei is as worth its deeply uncomfortable price of admission as Made in Abyss. And it carries the same curse as Made in Abyss, where it desperately makes you want to talk about it, but every time you do, you summon at least one K-pop stan. Though that is arguably better than the curse on Kamikatsu, working for God in a godless world, where every time you try to tell someone, the show's pretty good, actually, they just look at you like you have an anime head on a real human body. Which, again, pretty understandable, because, I mean, just look at this fucking thing. RUN! If you missed my coverage of Jibby 8 and X-Arm, it is entirely possible that you've never seen a more obviously bad, hideous anime in your entire life. And I'm not gonna tell you looks are deceiving here. It is bad. Aggressively, hilariously, eye-searingly so. That's not good. But that doesn't mean it can't also be good. In fact, Kamikatsu is the very best there is at being terrible on purpose. The show shows you right out of the OP that it can do top-notch Sakuga, and yet it consistently chooses not to. Instead, opting to construct a very strange aesthetic out of stiff, sloppy line art, inexplicable style shifts, random shots of 16-bit sprites, and, of course, jarringly out-of-place CGI all over the place. Hold on! Where are you going?! Hold up! Hurry! We might still be able to make it in time! This show legitimately hurts my brain to look at sometimes. I'm, I'm sure some of these clips are causing you pain right now, but when you actually sit down to watch the show in context, it all somehow works. At least for me, as a crap connoisseur, it's very refreshing to see animators making mistakes I've laughed at in other shows with the intent of making me laugh instead of just because they, you know, fucked up. <laughs> the strange beast is coming! Legends are stories! Counting on you is a bad idea! <laughs> that said, if you're not accustomed to bad and or trashy anime, this one does go from zero to blowjob CPR in less than a minute after Protag gets isekai by way of his dad's cult's ritual gone wrong, by the way. And by the midway point of the story, he's infiltrating an actual sex cult alongside a literal nymphomaniac, the village pervert, and an ancient primordial god who happens to look like a 12-year-old girl. So, you know... Expect a non-stop torrent of anime bullshit from this one. But, on the other hand, that village pervert is constantly being subjected to horrible and well-deserved violence, so maybe that'll be cathartic for the Mineta haters and offset the anime bullshit? It's hard to say, honestly. It's hard to say if anyone will like this show until they actually give it a try. All I can say for sure is Watching it will make you substantially less susceptible to cult propaganda and recruiting tactics, for reasons I've completely run out of time to explain, so I guess you'll just have to watch it to find out. Speaking of anime, where the hero's d gets whipped out in the very first episode, it's time to make good on my promise from the fall hottest trash and finally give Yoko Taro's death game anime, Kami Arabi God App, the roasting its fugly CGI ass so righteously deserves, is what I wish I could say, but I've hit a bit of a snag there. See, the reason I didn't do the roast initially last month is I ran out of time to watch enough of the show, and the three episodes I did test were so obviously terrible in so many ways, I knew it was an absolute shoe-in for this video. But then, when I finally got around to watching more, I kinda didn't want to stop. And the harder I looked for stuff to roast, the more I realized this show's kinda cooking. For starters, the powers at play here are way more interesting than most death games. At first, it seems like we're on standard Mirai Nikki rules. Everyone kills each other, and the last man standing gets to be God, just with 
slightly more varied, if still basic power sets for the participants like Big Knife or See Slightly Into Future. That is outside of Protag Kun Goro, who has the power to rewrite causality itself at the very hefty cost of ruining his own karma and dooming himself to never get a girlfriend for example. Gradually, though, it's revealed that basically every power set is on that world-shaking level, and the other characters just needed to figure it out. One villain can make the entire world believe any fake news story he comes up with and fabricate evidence for it. Another can take over people's minds by convincing them to open their hearts. It's really clever stuff, not just for setting up cool fights, but for testing and exploring the characters. And those characters are really good. They definitely don't leave the best first impression with how try-hard quirky they come off, uh, but then neither do a lot of great Yoko Taro characters. How many times have I told you? Don't roll around in the f***ing mud! And while Taro didn't actually write the dialogue, the screenwriter who took over for him, the Kaku City actor's creator Jin, is no slouch in that department, so everyone really grew on me the more time I spent with them. Over time, even my complaints about the CG started to fade. I mean, part of that was definitely that I just watched Fooly Cooly Grunge, and SD Gundam Force would look good next to that, but weird hands and limb proportions aside, the main character models are actually pretty well designed, especially in the faces and they animate with a lot of personality. Not to mention the show's overall direction is incredibly stylish. Of course, it's only the mains who are modeled that well. The background characters are literally faceless gray blobs, which makes everyone who's actually part of the death game stand out like a destructible rock in DBZ. But the show doesn't really need to keep the god candidate's identity secret to maintain tension. Not when the plot that Jin and Taro have cooked up has way wilder surprises in store. Like when Goro's favorite idol accidentally finds the porn on his PS3, and then the star of that porn pops out of the TV to ask them all for a favor. <laughs> <laughs> now, without question, this anime's got a lot of flaws that need looking past, but if you can, it is a ton of fun and a genuine breath of fresh air in an incredibly stagnant genre. So, as a substitute, I've decided to give this spot to the Near Automata anime instead. Not that the content of that anime is particularly cursed, but boy howdy, the production sure was. Anyway, I'm sorry if I've disappointed you by being so positive in this section so far, but I promise you the next two entries are gonna make up for it. Some anime curses are a little less obvious, and therefore a lot more insidious. This footage, for instance, will seem innocuous to many of you, if not adorable. It may even stir up fond memories for some who watched the anime years ago and never looked up anything else about it. But those who know about the manga will react almost certainly with pure revulsion, because they also know about the plot twist right after the anime ends, where it turns out this was a romance all along, and they were the love interests. Obviously, that was a bit of a shock for anyone who was emotionally invested in the whole heartwarming found family thing the anime had going on, but the new fall anime A Girl and Her Guard Dog has figured out the perfect solution to Usagi Drop's biggest problem. You take all that wholesome crap, throw it out the window, and quadruple down on the smut. The series follows Isaku, orphan granddaughter of a Yakuza Don, and Keia, young Yakuza thug, who's been assigned to protect her by the Don, and promised long ago that he'd become her, quote, mommy and her daddy, even her big brother, and anything else she wishes. In the present day, against her wishes, he's temporarily added Stalker to that list, using his crime connections to pull a reverse 21 Jump Street and infiltrate her new high school to prevent her from talking to boys. The anime calls his behavior a little overprotective. Personally, I'd call it a little psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> But then, of course, he's 
really hot, or, you know, he would be if the art was less janky, so that psycho behavior is by no means a deal breaker. Low key, she's a little into it, even. I mean, obviously, this is Fifty Shades adjacent girl trash we're talking about here. The only reason she says no to anything to begin with is the target audience thinks it's hotter if he has to convince you a little. But, of course, that means there's no real conflict driving the story at all, just a flimsy illusion of romantic tension. So, as a substitute, they gotta do things like have rival Yakuza thugs show up to kidnap her, sparking off a big, crazy car chase scene. And by big, crazy car chase scene, I mean... she gets kidnapped again, literally four episodes later in the middle of the obligatory school play arc by slightly more molesty Yakuza thugs, because that's how many ideas this anime has. It's honestly a little impressive how quickly this show turns a premise as audacious as Yakuza age gap pseudo incest into bland formulaic shoujo slop and that might be the most cursed thing about it. That feeling of desensitization when you look at an anime that's twisting itself in knots to be as edgy and offensive as possible and can only think, ah, oh, another one of those, huh? It's the sort of thing that makes you wonder how much all this anime bullshit has really gotten to you, twisted your mind and warped your perspective on what's normal. But if you ever find yourself in doubt like that, just consider, have you ever looked at a dog's tail and thought, man, that sure looks like a super suckable Cause if not, my life as Inukai-san's dog is proof positive you got a long way left to fall. <laughs> Inukai-san's dog is built around one very simple question. What if you got turned into a dog somehow and were then adopted by your crush, and then your crush turned out to be a sick zoophile freak, and in a shocking coincidence, so are all her hot friends? It's not a very good question to base a story on, kind of answers itself the second you ask it, really. But then, just going out on a limb here, I doubt this show's target audience cares all that much about the plot. Though, considering the show looks like warmed over dog shit, anyone coming for the plot probably won't leave all that satisfied either. Now, if you're watching on YouTube rather than Patreon, you may have to take my word for it that there's some very bad art and animation behind all these adorable animals. There's just not a lot of this show that YouTube will let me show you. Not that you'd want to see it anyway, unless maybe you're very drunk with some friends you're very comfortable with, because I won't mince words here, this is the don't watch an anime called Boku of bestiality. If you're curious to know more about the very cursed specifics of its plot though, Yazzie dropped a little roast of the manga over on her channel a while back that I'd encourage you to check out when we're done here. Which is now, actually. Oh, thank Haruhi, I'm finally free. Also, thanks Opera for sponsoring this whole thing, and most importantly, thank you for sticking with me through this lengthy look back at one of the most exciting years in anime history. Unfortunately, there wasn't time to spotlight all the great or terrible shows this year, but if you want to hear my thoughts on those, that's what the ones to watch and Hottest Trash are for. And if you want to share your thoughts on those, I'd absolutely love to hear what you think are 2023's best, worst, and most cursed anime in the comments below. I'm Jeff Thu, professional too much anime watcher, and I think I'm gonna go play some video games for the next week.